Good evening, everybody. We're just giving it a few, few moments for everyone to pop in. Got a fair few there. All right. Ooh, we're at 6.02. All right, um, I'll give it one more minute because we did have a few extra registrations. So just when it hits 6.03, I'll start. <laughs> now I've said that, nobody else is popping in. Oh, wait, hang on, it moved again. I'm just commentating the boxes opening. Oh, now I've said that. Now I'm going to have to sit here and look at the two until it turns into a three. Or do I just start? There we go. It says three. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, webinar tonight. My name is Michelle Cullen. I work for the Healthcare Consumers Association. And tonight we're presenting... Um, a great webinar on gut health to improve your overall health. Um, so tonight with me, I've got another HCCA staff member, C, who's doing the tech support. Um, and then four uh, final year master's students from the University of Canberra and their supervisor, Amelia. But before I get too far into all of the introductions, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on um, traditional lands and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing connection to country and the richness and value this adds to the life of this city and region. Um, I'd also like to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us tonight. Um, so as I said, um, we're going to be talking all things gut health and microbiomes and overall health. Just to give everybody a little bit of background for housekeeping in Zoom, I think we've all got pretty good at Zoom these days, but if you have any um, tech issues, just sort of flail your arms around or um, put your hand up or type in the chat, you know, if you can't hear or see, but often if uh, we find it's easier if you put it on the gallery view so you can sort of see everybody, but there will be a presentation shared. Um, so... If everybody keeps themselves on mute, that cuts down on the static and stops any sort of dog barking in the background and whatnot. If you're finding it's a little bit hard to um, hear, you can turn your video off and that sometimes helps clear up the audio if you need to. Um, we're going to have some question breaks throughout um, the sections of the presentation, but if you've got something in the forefront of your mind and you don't want to forget, because that often happens to me, um, type it into the chat. And when we come to the next question time, um, we'll read out the questions from the chat. Um, there's no such thing as a silly question in any of uh, these seminars. Um, and what else have I got in my little... Uh, we run these seminars just to give people some information and general advice about different topics to do with health. Um, so we like to keep the questions and the content fairly general, but... Um, if you have specific questions, it's, you know, always good to check with your own health professional. Um, so we've got four final year master's students from the University of Canberra. They are studying nutrition and dietetics. Um, they're currently seeing clients in the UC student clinics and uh, coming to the end of their studies. So this is a really good opportunity for them to start um, using their knowledge and skills and sharing information to the public. Um, so we're very excited and grateful to have them here tonight. And their supervisor um, is also on with us, Amelia. So um, we have, so scroll back up, Xiao Xiao Zhang, Anastasia, Hello, Ka <laughs> Anastasia <laughs> Katsenovakis, um, Samantha Lee and Alethea Phillips. And they're all going to be presenting um, one part each of tonight. So without further ado, what did I do? 606, that's not too bad. I'm going to hand over to Xiao Xiao to start our first icebreaker poll and then launch into the first section of the presentation. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit of how dietitians can be involved with enhancing your health. Now I'm going to share my screen. 
Um, uh, we're going to do the poll first before you share. Okay. So does anyone <laughs> know what dietitians do? So everybody can click on their own screens. They should be able to multiple choice. Have a guess at what dietitians do. Do, 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 do. I always love to do the quiz music. Do, 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 do. Once we've all clicked and submitted, I think it times out after like 10 seconds and it will tell us the right answer. Has everyone popped their response in? Ta-da! All of the above. Whoa! Okay, <laughs> now you can share um, CSEO and tell us all about the wonderful work of dietitians. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for everyone. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And so dietetics apply the sense of food and nutrition to promote health. And this could be in the form of managing diets and nutrition for people affected with a range of health conditions, such as overweight, obese, uh, heart disease, diabetes, cancer. Were you, were you gonna share? I can't see your screen yet. Did oh, it pop up? Really? Um, <laughs> Is sorry. it working? It's always hard to do it under pressure, isn't it? Um. I try to um, um give me one second. Share window, yeah, the share window one. Just because it gives such great visuals to all of us to be able to really oh, think yes, about. I, I don't know what happened. I just did it. <laughs> Sorry. Um Anastasia, do you want to share for CRCR and then you can talk and signal when you want the slide yeah. to go to the next one? I don't know why what happened. It doesn't That's work. okay. We have backups. <laughs> there we go. So we're on what do dietitians do? Yeah. The next one. Next one. There Thank we go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> oh, loudly. Um where I am. Okay. So we provide group educations about nutrition. We also offer one-to-one -one counseling and develop interventions that are best suited to your personal condition. Um, so how our digestive system works? Um, so its main job is to transforming the raw material of our food into the nutrients and energy that keep us alive. Um, so our digestinal tract has an internal surface area of 13 to 40 square meters. So enough to cover half a badminton court. <laughs> so our body's enzymes, hormones, nerves, and blood all work together to break down food, uh, modu modulate the digestive process, and deliver the final products. So our... Um, so the digestive process begins before food even hits your tongue. So anticipating a tasty food glands your our mouth, start pumping out the saliva. So once food inside our mouth, chewing combines with the enzymes in the saliva, began the process of bring, breaking down food. The nerves in and the esophageal tissues sense the food presence and trigger a series of muscular contractions that prop propel the food into our stomach. So our stomach store and churns food chunks with uh, digestive enzymes and acid. Then after three hours inside the stomach, uh, so the half digestive food is ready to move into the small intestine. So meanwhile, you are um, pancreas and liver make digestive juice that has enzymes and bell, then deliver it into the first portion of our small intestine where to mix food with this digestive juice to continue the digestion process. And so the small intestines, lower regions, uh, which are coated in millions of tiny projections called villi. And this creates a huge surface area to maximize food molecule absorption and transfer them into the bloodstream. 
and uh, the blood takes them to feed the body. Sorry, to feed the body's organs and tissues. And, and then leftovers, fiber, and water go into the large intestine, also known as colon. The food, um, the body drain, drain out of most of remaining fluid throughout of the intestine wall. So what's left is a soft mass called stool. Then the colon squeezes this byproduct out of the body. And next, please. So how the food you eat affect your gut? So trillions of bacteria and virus live on or inside of us. Most of the bacteria hang out in the large intestine. They form the gut microbiome, which is a rich ecosystem that performs a variety of functions in our body. So healthy gut bacteria help us digest a certain food such as carbohydrates, fatty acids, and synthesis of vitamins. It also acts as a barrier to protect our immune system, lower our risk factors of uh, chronic disease, and it even affects our mood. So we don't yet have the blueprint for exactly which good bacteria our guts need, but we do know that it's important for a healthy a microbiome to have a variety of bacteria species. So the more diverse your gut bacteria is, the less likely for one bacteria to become dominant enough to make you sick. And so many factors can affect our microbiomes, uh, including our genes, uh, mm -hmm. our age, the environment we live, and also medicines such as antibiotics, and even whether we were delivered by C-section or not. Mm. So that is one of the leading influence on the health of our gut. While we can't control all these factors, but we can manipulate the balance of our microbes by paying attention to what we eat. And for example, animal-based diet and plant-based diet can encourage different dominating species. This is also emerging, there is also emerging research about a modern diet rich in salt, sugar, or fatty processed of food may potentially damage our gut. Mm. Next slide, please. Um, so why maintaining a healthy gut is important? So firstly, our gut is not just help us digest and absorb nutrients for our body. It also communicates with our brain to maintain the balance inside of our body. And secondly, it's the first barrier of our immune system to detect and destroy any organism that may cause disease. And lastly, um, a healthy gut can help us lower the risk of chronic disease such as overweight, obese, uh, heart disease, and diabetes. Now I'm going to pass over to Anastasia, who is going to talk about the relationship between gut and uh, health conditions. Oh, sorry, any checking questions, please? Any questions so far? Anything so far? Or where... That was really good. I've, um, I like that summary and that diagram. But, yep, no, nothing so far. So we will move over to Anastasia. Great. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. So thank you, Zhao Zhao. I'm going to briefly touch on the link between gut health and other health conditions. Now, it's important to remember that how we each experience a health condition will be different. So if you have a specific health concern, it's important to consult a medical professional such as your GP for personalised advice tailored to your individual needs. Um, so as you can see, our gut is involved in many of our body's processes. Um, as you can imagine, it can also be linked to many other issues that can occur within our bodies. The main processes poor gut health can have noticeable impacts on include our metabolism, which is the process by which our body turns what we eat into energy, um, the gut-lung axis or the pathway between our gut and our lung, the gut-brain axis, our immune system, and also our heart. 
So over the next five slides, I'm going to touch on some more common conditions that can be related to our um, the health of our gut. So let's start by talking about some common gastrointestinal diseases, which I will refer to as GI diseases. Um, unfortunately, we won't have the opportunity to delve deeply into each one, but as you can see, there are many different types of GI diseases which fall under many different categories. It's important to understand that while these conditions do affect the gut, um, they all have different triggers and symptoms and therefore very different dietary treatments and management strategies. Um, a formal diagnosis by a GP or gastroenterologist is essential for effective treatment. Um, so for example, uh, diverticular disease um, compared to celiac disease, while they're both GI diseases, diverticular disease is an inflammatory disease where pouches develop in the colon. Um, now, treatment approaches can vary widely depending on individual symptoms, but could include um, medications, surgical interventions, or nutritional interventions, um, or a combination of these three. However, it needs to be tailored to the patient's individual and specific needs. Um, in comparison, celiac disease is a malabsorptive disease, um, which is triggered by gluten intolerance, which then requires dietary management um, and the complete avoidance of gluten and a strict nutritional intervention to man manage symptoms effectively. So understanding the diversity of GI diseases highlights the importance of a personalized medical advice um, and tailored treatment plans that, and that there's no one size fits all approach. So it's important to always consult, as I said before, a medical professional um, for a formal diagnosis and um, appropriate management strategies. Um, so on to mental health, the gut-brain axis is a two-way communication system between your gut and your brain through a nerve called the vagus nerve. Um, communication by this nerve can either be physical or chemical. Um, so a classic example of the physical communication pathway is having um, those butterflies that you feel in your stomach when you're feeling anxious or nervous. Um, so the types of bacteria in your gut play a crucial role in this type of communication. Some of these bacteria produce substances called short chain fatty acids, also known as SCFAs. Um, so that's your gut physically communicating with your brain. But it's not just about our feelings. Um, the type of bacteria living in our gut also plays a crucial role in this. So when bacteria produces these SCFAs, they break down um, food and the SCFAs have actually been found to be beneficial when helping reduce anxiety. Um, so chemical communication happens through neurotransmitters, which are responsible for carrying chemical messages around your body. Um, so some key neurotransmitters include serotonin, which is known as our happy chemical, um, found mostly in the gut, GABA, which is known as our calming chemical um, and has receptors in both the brain and the gut, and dopamine, which is our pleasure, motivation, memory and mood hormone, um, and that's produced in the gut as well. Um, so how does gut health impact mental health? Any changes or disruptions in the gut microbiome can actually reduce the production of SCFAs and decrease the level of serotonin, GABA and dopamine that's reaching our brains, um, which can then lead to poor mood, increased anxiety, depression and any other mental health conditions. Um, so our gut health doesn't only influence our mental state, it also plays an important and significant role in our physical health, particularly in relationship to obesity. Um, so as Zha Zha mentioned, our microbiome significantly influences how food is digested and absorbed. Um, the diverse community of bacteria in our gut help break down carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, making nutrients available for our body to use. The microbiome affects how dietary fats are metabolized and stored, um, potentially impacting our overall fat storage and our energy balance. So our gut bacteria also has the ability to digest certain antioxidants that are found in plants, um, and these are known as flavonoids. So these compounds are actually beneficial as they help protect our body from oxidative stress and cellular damage. So when our gut metabolizes flavonoids, they not only amplify their protective benefits, but they can also promote metabolic health, aiding in weight management and overall well-being. 
In terms of hormones, your body produces a number of different hormones that affect your appetite. Um, so these are leptin, which is your satiety hormone and lets you know when you feel full, um, and ghrelin, which is your hunger hormone, which lets you know when you're hungry. So some studies have actually shown that different bacteria in the gut can affect how much of these hormones are produced and whether you feel hungry or you feel full. Um, and then as we learned earlier, your gut also produces your pleasure hormone, dopamine, um, discretionary foods such as chocolate trigger the release of dopamine, which activates the reward center in our brains. Um, and so behavior is reinforced. And this can help explain why you keep on going back for that block of chocolate or you just can't seem to put it down um, is because of dopamine being reduced, uh, produced. Um, another weight-related hormone for both men and women that can be influenced by our gut bacteria is estrogen. So if our microbiome becomes disrupted, our bodies can start producing or circulating too much or too little estrogen, which can then disrupt our metabolism and change where we store our body fat. High levels of estrogen are more likely to cause fat deposits around our arms, our buttocks, our thighs, and our breasts, um, while low estrogen causes fat deposits around our abdomen and our stomach area, which can then increase the risk of other diseases which are related to obesity, such as type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Um, so immunity is also super important to our overall health, especially um, as we're in winter and we move through the cold and flu season and try to avoid that current um, COVID-19 outbreak that's going on at the moment. So around 70% of your immune system resides in your gut. Our immune system and our gut bacteria work together to create our body's first line of defense against invaders, um, preventing harmful bacteria um, viruses, fungi, and parasites from living in our gut. Our bacteria then talks to our immune cells, training them um, to identify dangerous invaders like a virus and not to attack friendly bacteria or even our body's own cells and tissues. Um, this training also helps regulate our immune system's responses so our immune system doesn't overreact. Um, we want our immune system to spring into action if we catch a cold, but not go into defense mode against something like a new food that we're trying. Um, so if the health and diversity of our gut bacteria declines or is out of balance, it can actually throw our immune system out of balance as well. Um, and this can result in your immune system not working as it should. And you may develop or see a worsening of chronic inflammatory diseases such as asthma, endometriosis and, or diabetes and autoimmune conditions, um, which is where your immune system attacks things that it shouldn't. Um, now, as we age, the diversity of our gut bacteria naturally declines, impacting our immunity. So this decline makes it harder for us to fight off viruses and infections um, as effectively as we used to. And this makes it even more important um, for us to look after our gut as we do age. Um, now, lastly, I wanted to talk about an interesting and often overlooked connection between our gut health and the well-being of our joints. As I mentioned earlier, 70% of our immune system resides in our gut, and the types of bacteria pr present can influence various parts of our body, including our joints. Um, so certain gut bacteria, like one called streptococcus, releases toxins that can trigger inflammation. This inflammation doesn't just stay in the gut, it can spread throughout the body, affecting our joints. Um, when this happens, the immune system may mistakenly attack our own cells and cartilage, cartilage particularly in joints such as the knee and the ankle. Um, and researchers believe that this inflammation caused by these toxins can actually accelerate the development of joint-related diseases such as osteoarthritis, regardless of factors such as obesity and joint strain. Um, additionally, the malfunctioning of the immune system is often behind common types of inflammatory arthritis, including gout and rheumatoid arthritis. So I think that this really highlights the critical importance of maintaining a healthy gut microbiome. A balanced gut can support not only our mental health, but also weight. It keeps our immune system in check and also our joints pain-free. Does anyone have any questions after that little section? Anybody? Um, I do. <laughs> it's probably the million dollar question. Yeah. How do you make the good bacteria win over? Like, how do you make it all get in balance and win and be good and happy? Is that what we're going to find out next? Yes. I was going to say, Alethea and Samantha, <laughs> are a 
up about that. So if that's still a question at the end, I'm more than happy to jump back in. But let's see what they say and then <laughs> have another discussion about it later. And I think we've got a comment in the chat. I've definitely noticed that certain foods set off my rheumatoid arthritis. So that's really interesting. I noticed that stress and the way I eat affects like hay fever and allergies and other things. Get, yeah, so it's, you, you realize how it's all connected and how interesting it is. But then sometimes behaviors and psychology around your eating is also quite tricky. And so it all plays in together. That was most interesting, someone else put. All right, so we are ready. If no one else has got any questions, we are ready to move on to you, Samantha, for the million-dollar question of what can we do to make our gut microbiome super happy and release all the happy, calm hormones get rid of all the bad inflammation ones. What do we need to do? Well, um, let's make this one. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, that's looking yep. good. Well, <clears throat> um, thank you, Anastasia. So how do we ensure we eat the right foods beneficial for our guts? Well, diet plays an important role in maintaining our, our gut health and bowel regulations. Yep. yep. However, gut health isn't only determined by the foods we eat or drink. Based on this slide, as well as eating a healthy diet, other lifestyle and environmental factors such as physical activity, pre and probiotics, hydration and stress can all affect our gut health. But for now, we shall focus on what exactly a healthy diet consists of. Um, what are the specific recommendations for fruit and vegetable intake? What fiber is and why is it important for our gut health? So the first tip is to have a healthy diet with a diverse range of foods. Here we, I have the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. This is a food selection guide which visually represents the proportion of the five food groups uh, so, uh, recommended for consumption each day. These key food groups include fruits, vegetables, grains and cereals, lean uh, lean meat and other protein alternatives, um, dairy and, and alternatives. Um, an interesting fact is that different diets can change the microbiomes. Uh, research, research has shown that a vegetarian or a vegan diet fosters different microbiotas in comp on being compared to om an omnivore diet. In addition, um, increased vegetable in diet can actually cause a more diverse microbiome. So I guess the take home message is a healthy diet should consist of a variety of foods from all different food groups. Eating a diverse uh, range of foods can lead to a more diverse biome with different types of bacteria in our guts. We get different types um, of their benefits. Gut bacteria needs fiber to flourish. So the more fruit and vegetable you consume, the better. So Pop quiz, what do you think is the percentage of Australian adults who meet the recommended daily serves of fruit and vegetables? We just have a quiz. So if everyone can click on their screen, how, what percentage of people over 18 do you think met the requirement for both their fruit and vegetable intake? So how many people in Australia over 18 eat enough fruit and vegetable serves in a day? Surely we all do. Surely. Do, 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 do. I get to do the quiz music again. Oh, oh, that's not right. <laughs> I so put the actually, wrong answer. <laughs> so Incorrect, Michelle. Not according to the National it. Health Survey conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, in 2022, found that an estimated of 36% of children and adolescents aged 2 to 17 do not meet the daily recommendation of fruits, and 96% do not meet the recommended serves of vegetables. In addition, adults, 56% uh, do not meet the recommended serves of fruit, and 94% do not meet the recommended serves of vegetables. So, so on the this... actual the actual answer was five to ten percent. Most people seem to be a little bit better at eating fruit because for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, there was very over ninety six percent of people I think do not meet the vegetable requirements. So I actually loaded that quiz wrong and put the wrong right answer. But the right answer was five to ten percent. Mm -hmm. 
So on this slide, I have the uh, recommended daily intake of vegetable and fruit. Um, so for the majority, um, it's recommended that you have between five to six serves of vegetables. And this actually might sound like a lot first, but one standard serve can be a medium tomato, a cup of raw vegetable or half a cup of cooked vegetables. Um, aim for variety. There are so many vegetables to choose from um, and the more colors, the better, as this indicates a wide variety of nutrients. Um, some tips to increase vegetable intake could be adding some to soup, uh, wraps or even bulking up sauces. So if you're having spaghetti bolognese, adding some, you know, some lentils in there would um, increase your vegetable intake. Mm, that's what, what I do to my kids, hide the vegetables. <laughs> I've minced them up in the blender first so they can't see them and then hide them in the bolognese sauce. Mm -hmm. For everyone, an average of two serves of fruit is recommended each day. And this can look like one medium apple or banana or orange, two small fruits such as apricots or mandarins or half a cup of, of berries. Um, try to limit fruit juice, especially pulp free. Um, to occasions um, because most of the fiber is actually found in the skin of fruits and it's easy to over consume fruits in this form. Um, adding fruits to plain or sparkling water is an easy way to pump up your intake um, like adding lemon slices or cucumber slices to water and one of the main reasons we try and encourage more fruit and vegetable in your diet is because they are often high in fiber and so this leads to our third tip which is try and ingre increase our fiber intake. <clears throat> so what is fiber? Fiber is a part of the food that's not digested. It can help feel uh feel you uh, help you feel fuller for longer. A key role of fiber is to provide prebiotics, a non-digested part of food that keeps uh, that feeds the good bacteria in our guts. Fiber is essential, essentially the main food source for good bacteria living in our guts. This allows them to grow and support our bod body functions, such as our immune system, hormone production, and overall gut health. So there are different types of fiber. Um, soluble fiber, which attracts water and turns into gel during digestion. This slows down digestion and is generally found in fruits and vegetables, legumes, rice bran, psyllium husk, and soy flour. Insoluble fiber, which add bulks to stool and regulate bowel functions to prevent constipation and can be found in fruit and vegetable skin, whole grain, um, nuts and, and nuts and seeds. So a lack of fiber in the diet can limit the amount of nutrients your gut bacteria gets and therefore they cannot perform their job that they are meant to uh, be doing to keep your gut active. So the, as you can see on the screen, the current recommendation uh, for male adults is to aim for 30 grams of fiber each day and for females 25 grams. If you are pregnant, then it's actually recommended that you consume about 28 grams a day. Um, a review in 2018 um, states that in Australia, only 60% of children and 70% of adults are meeting the cu uh, current fiber recommendations and less than 20% of adults are meeting the suggested dairy uh, dietary target to reduce risk of chronic diseases. So, so we're, doing, we're doing better on fiber than we are on vegetables. Mm -hmm. But um, fi so you got biome and all the little happy bacteria in there it loves to eat fiber so bulking up fiber is a good way to make your gut environment happy i like that and probably combining the two you if we were doing better in vegetables we'd probably be meeting our fiber fi well. yeah i was gonna say because <laughs> so yeah we're doing okay with fruit and fiber vegetables bump it up there fiber's mm -hmm. good to go happy gut happy life mm -hmm. love it mm -hmm. so <laughs> How can we start? Uh, how can we slowly start to introduce more fiber in our diet? Well, fiber is, as mentioned earlier, fiber is ma mainly found in plant foods, especially in carbohydrates like whole grains and high fiber cereals such as Sultana Bran or Bran, wheat bix or oats. Not only does whole grain uh, produce uh, products provide fiber, they also help control cholesterol levels and blood pressure. Plant, based, uh, plant foods include fruit and vegetables, can be eaten fresh, frozen, or dried. Nuts and, nuts and seeds or legumes and lentils are also high in fiber. So some tips to increase your fiber intake include choosing whole meal or whole grain. Um, this can be switching out to whole grain or even multi-grain bread. 
swapping to brown uh, instead of white rice or, and choosing wholemeal noodles and pasta, adding some fresh and dried fruits to cereal, and I guess since it's winter, to porridge or even to yogurt. Adding some nuts or seeds are a great source of fiber as well. Swapping out some of your typical snacks that are uh, with those higher in fiber. So high fiber snacks include uh, fresh fruits such as mandarins and kiwis, which are actually in season at the moment. Raw vegetables such as celery or carrots with hummus, a handful of nuts and seeds, and wholemeal crackers are all other good options. Try to leave the skin on fruits and vegetables as this is where most of the fiber is. And if you're having stews or casserole style dishes, try swapping out some of the meat with lentils, beans, chickpeas, or other vegetables. And I guess, although it may seem like the best to make sudden changes to the diet straight away, which is probably what most people choose to do, it's actually best to increase your fiber intake gradually over a few weeks. Um, so this will allow the natural bacteria in your gut to adjust to the change. Because if you think about it, imagine you are a colony of bacteria living in someone's intestine. Suddenly you're just man you know, doing your all your work and then suddenly your food intake doubles or even triples in a few days. You probably get overwhelmed and might feel bloated and gassy. Yeah. So on this slide are some comparisons between typical pantry staples on the right and the high fiber counterparts on the left. Um, as you can see at the top, wheat bix have eight times the amount of fiber compared to rice bubbles. Whole grain, bread, whole grain bread has double the amount as your white bread. Peeling potatoes can remove 40% of fiber. And these are just some of our suggestions in increasing fiber intake by making healthier swaps. So I guess look at this slide and I would love for all of you guys um, to type in the chat box one potential swap that you think you could do to increase your fiber. Um, you can use the swaps written here, or you can even use your uh, think of your own. And swaps can range from swapping your plain muesli to one with fruits and nuts, all the way up to aiming to five serves of vegetable per day and two serves of fruit. So we're just having a little second here for everyone to type something they could swap to something more fibrous. Did you like my interpretive dance of like <laughs> getting bloated and gassy because I was being the colony of bacteria? Yes. Probably um, imagine if you had a whole massive whack of fiber. <laughs> I don't think your, uh, your gut would be super healthy, health, uh, helpful. No, that's what I'm trying to say. Super happy to immediately be bombarded. But so what do we got? I put not peeling sweet potatoes and pumpkins when I roast them. I just got into a habit a long time ago of like peeling the veg. But if you leave the skins on, it's quite crunchy and delicious and they're nice. Leave the skins on vegetables. Keep the skins also red and black rice. That's true. Um, there's what's that? There's um, the little burrito bowls that come with that nice red and black rice. It takes a bit longer to cook, but it is very delicious. Eating the skin on the kiwi fruit. It's a bit furry. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could come at that. That's a bit tricky, but yeah. Unprocessed fruits and grains are easy. Leave the skins on. So we've got a lot of votes for leaving the skins on things. And black rice makes good risotto. Well, oh, never thought of that. It's a good idea. Is anyone, I was expecting people to go like, I'm going to swap white bread for brown bread, but we've got a lot of, um, veggie skins and black rice risotto are the key takeaways from our fiber swapping. Make those little bacteria happy. Yes. All right. Well, carry on. Yes. Well, I guess if there's no more questions, I will now hand over to um, Alethea, um, who will be discussing our remaining three tips on improving your gut health. All righty. Hello, everyone. Hello. Up there. You're <laughs> All right. The can we see this? We can. That Wonderful. Was delightful. Wonderful. Okay. So thank you, Samantha. Another way that we can look after our gut is eating a diet full of pre and probiotics. So prebiotics are plant fibers that act like a fertilizer for your gut. Um, stimulating the growth of healthy bacteria. So we can think of this as pre, before, probiotics as they lay the groundwork for probiotics to come in and do their thing. 
As Samantha said before, prebiotic foods are rich in fiber, such as our whole grains, um, legumes, beans, fruits, and veggies. So if you're aiming to eat foods high in fiber, you are most likely eating foods high in prebiotics, which is great news for your gut. So where prebiotics act like the fertilizer, probiotics are the flowers in which prebiotics help thrive. So probiotics are foods that contain live bacteria um, that make their way down to your gut and help keep your gut microbiome healthy. Probiotic foods include foods such as yogurts, some cheeses, fermented foods such as our kefir, our kombucha, sauerkraut, and then some more are shown on the screen there. All right. Hydration, water, so important. To help our guts function the best that they can, we need to keep our bodies hydrated. So drinking water throughout the day helps break down and digest foods, prevent constipation, and regulates our bowel movements. And those are just the benefits for our guts. Staying hydrated has so many other benefits for our health overall as well. So also, if we are increasing our fiber intake, which Samantha touched on before, it is so important that we increase our water intake with this. As fiber works best in our bodies when it is consumed with water, water as soluble fiber will absorb water. So if we imagine our bowel kind of like a bit like a blocked pipe and we need to drink water to make um, it kind of move on a lot easier. So we're going to do a quick poll. This poll will be how much do you think is the recommended uh, water intake for adult men and women per day? So hopefully that's come up on everyone's screen. And hopefully I put the right answer as the answer this time. <laughs> Don't worry, I can see the you can answer. You can, tell me, uh, you can tell me if I haven't. Do, 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 do. I've got my quiz music. Do, 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 do. How much water should we drink? Michelle, I don't know, but I think it's just showing what, what you answered yourself, but not showing the result. Oh. When does it come poll? up now? You are viewing your quiz results. All right. Um, Can anyone else see that? Hopefully the correct answer coming up on people's screen is men at 2.5 litres and women 2 <laughs> litres. Yes. How did we go? Zoom polls and quizzes are not my strong suit. Let's <laughs> just say that. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So if you are someone who can find it hard to reach the recommended daily water intake, there are other ways that we can get our water intake that isn't just involved uh, drinking water. So, for example, our herbal teas, eating our fruit and veggies with high water content. So, Cucumber, watermelon, lettuce, these are all high um, in water content. Or even adding flavours to our water, such as our lemon lime um, or our fruits. Are other ways <laughs> it says help. capsicum on there. Does anyone have capsicum flavoured water often? <laughs> Not sure about that one. I think that's more that's um, high in water content. Oh, and right. So okay. I mean, <laughs> yes. I read that wrong. I'm like, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. Listen, if that's Please what you want to do, go for it. <laughs> Absolutely oh. water. It's probably <laughs> delicious. It's probably delicious. Oh. Um, so yes, to increase your hydration, make water your number one choice of fluid over drinks such as our juice and our soft drinks. Um, these drinks can still have a place in a healthy diet. However, water should be the first choice. Okay, moving on to stress. So stress can also have huge impacts on how our gut functions. Stress can be experienced in many different forms. As you can imagine, sometimes some or all of these can be impacting us at the same time. So as Anastasia touched on earlier, stress can interfere with our gut-brain axis. So when we become stressed, there are a number of things that can be happening in our body, particularly in our guts. So the above picture shows a nice outline of some of the things that can happen in our gut when we are in a state of stress. But in a nutshell, stress puts our body in a state of fight or flight. And when our body goes into a state of fight or flight, it puts us into a survival state, um, delaying processes that aren't essential or necessarily needed for survival, one of which is digestion. So when our digestion process is put on the back burn and slows down, processes in our stomach are slowed down, which can result in things such as decreased nutrient absorption, um, symptoms such as nausea, constipation, diarrhea, cramping, indigestion, heartburn, all of the above. So stress can also ca cause inflammation in our intestines and can even make the barrier in our intestines weaker, which can lead to our gut leaking bacteria into our body. This is normally fine, 
as our immune system comes along and helps us clear this out. However, you can imagine that when this happens recurringly, our immune system gets tired of constantly helping, which can in turn lead to chronic gut issues. So it's so important that you find strategies that help you when you are feeling stressed, (laughs) such as, um, so yes, this differs for each person um, and it could include things such as meditation, mindfulness activities, talking to your friends, your family, um, a counsellor, even just ensuring that we're getting enough sleep and exercise as well. All right. So similarly to stress, there are a few other things that can negatively impact our gut health. So medicines and antibiotics can change the amount and type of bacteria within our microbiome, which can change and potentially even damage it. So some medicines include our antibiotics, laxative, anti-inflammatories. And this doesn't mean that we shouldn't take these medications as they can be really important and crucial at times. Um, But it is good to be aware of how they can impact our gut and what we can do when taking these medications to try and counterbalance the um, damage they potentially cause includes things such as taking probiotics with them, especially with antibiotics and taking all those steps that we spoke on previously. So next, a diet in high in ultra processed foods can interfere with our gut brain axis also and cause inflammation. So ultra processed foods can be high in salt, fat, sugars, artificial sweeteners, other chemicals and preservatives that extend the food shelf life and essentially keep those foods safe for us to eat. These foods can be such as takeaway foods, our pre-processed foods, our pre-packaged foods, sorry, commercially baked goods, um, our chips, lollies, soft drinks, all of those sorts of foods. And due to the processing nature of these foods, they can be higher in those harmful microbes um, that can ultimately affect the healthy gut bacteria of our microbiome. And then we've got alcohol and excessive alcohol consumption can also cause inflammation and affect the gut lining, which means that other substances in our gut can cross into our bloodstream, particularly toxins, and can overall impact our microbiome. So it can also make it harder for our digestive enzymes to break down food when we eat it. Um, as it impacts the gut-liver axis that Anastasia briefly spoke about earlier as well. Okay, next slide. So artificial sweeteners are synthetic sugar substitutes. They can be used in sachet form, like in the image to the left over here, such as our Splendor, our Equal, Um, and they're often put in coffee, drinks, baked goods, or they can already be in pre-packaged products. So artificial sweeteners can alter the gut microbiome and subsequently lead to our body not being able to break down the sugars in our body well, building an intolerance and disturbances to our metabolism. They can create an imbalance in our gut microbiome and we can even cause gas and bloating as they aren't easily digested. Then we've got poor sleep and exercise can lead to poor bacteria diversity and increased inflammation. So when we sleep, we're allowing our body to rest and digest Our body gets to have a break from all the busy things that we're doing throughout the day. However, when we don't get a proper sleep, this can put our body in a state of stress, which we know from our stress slide does not make our guts feel very good. Studies have even shown that when we exercise, the beneficial bacteria in our gut can increase by up to 40%, which is huge. Moving our bodies also helps to keep things moving through our digestive tract, regulating our bowel movements, meaning helping us go to the toilet, essentially. So the key takeaway message from these slides is to maintain a healthy gut, particularly if you can be prone to gut health issues. Try and limit the intake of ultra-processed foods, alcohol, and artificial sweeteners, and try to move our body with exercise and get good quality sleep. Okay, now what we're going to do is a bit of a check-in. After our section on eating tips for a healthy gut, We will just do a little activity. So we've got two lists here, positive impacts and negative impacts. Going to use um, potentially the reaction buttons or post in the chat what you think. Um, I just do a thumbs up or thumbs down. A a manual one if you've got your video on. Or if you can see the little reactions button at the bottom of your screen, you can do a thumbs up or uh, if you scroll through, or you can just type thumbs up or thumbs down in the chat. Any way to indicate a positive or a negative will help Alethea put the impact in the right column, essentially. That would be great. So I'll read them out and I'll yep. see what the reactions are and then we'll see which column it should go in. 
So the first one I've got is increase fiber intake. What do we think? Yay or I'm nay? Gonna go, I'm going to go, woo, thumbs up. Mm-hmm. Oh, look at all the little thumbs up waving in the in the chat. Wonderful. <laughs> I can't see them, but good job. There's, there's many um, many on this, my side of my screen. Oh, yeah, because you're screen sharing. Yep. Yeah. Good job, everyone. Good job. So maybe if you can help report what the, what the answer is. I'll, I'll report like. back. But, yeah, Perfect. Positive. Fiber is <laughs> good. The little bacteria just love it. Good job. All right. So eating a diverse food from the five food groups is the next one. Do we think that's positive or negative? Ooh, diversity. Boop. Everyone's thumbs upping. Diversity is good. Correct. And then we've got stress. Oh, no. What are we going to do about stress? Everyone's struggling to find the... I'm going to use this one. Bow, bow. Oh, look, two people found the thumbs down. Who thumbs up stress? <laughs> Someone put laughing emojis. <laughs> uh, thumbs down. Boo. Boo stress. stress. is negative. And then we've got it really artificial. Is. It is. It is. Stress isn't good with anything. <laughs> All right. So then we've got artificial sweeteners. Oh, this is a tricky one. Mm. Divided opinions. We've got a few thumbs down. Mm. I'm going to do this face because oh. like low in calories, obviously if you, yeah, but mm. bow bow for the set point bow of this, bow. it did say in there, bow bow. It did. It did. Okay. Eating foods with pre and probiotics. Woo. Thumbs up everybody. <laughs> oh. Is there a food that has, both pre and probiotics is there a super pre and pro food oh um fermented bananas something that's fermented but it was also mm. high in fiber cat what about the cat like um kimchi what about kimchi i'm gonna go with kimchi kimchi it's got cabbage it's got fermented <laughs> They're called, when they have a combination of both, I think they're called symbiotics. Mm. Um, so I think sauerkraut and kimchi, potentially kaffir. I'm not 100% sure about the kaffir, but, yeah, uh, kimchi. What, what, what is, that. I've heard, is, are you saying that K-E-F-I-R, kaffir, kefir, kefir, what is that? It's, I believe, mm. like a fermented milk. Milk? Yogurt? Yogurt. Kind of fermented milk yogurt. 100% sure how it's done. Some sort know. of fermented dairy. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Um, kimchi has fiber and good cultures, C says, and it's fermented milk drink, almost like a yogurt. So maybe like those little yakults. <laughs> or is that is that fermented something? Anyway, let's not go into it. Okay. Um, it's eating it's probiotics. Thank you. Oh, they're probiotics. Yep. Okay. Eating foods with pre and probiotics was good. Yay. Oh, good. Absolutely. Then we've got poor sleep and exercise. Oh, boo. Boo, poor sleep and exercise. Oh, wait. Exercise is good, though. Poor sleep and poor exercise. Poor, got yeah, it. poor sleep and poor exercise. <laughs> boo. Yeah. Oh, that, so that was a confusing one. Some people did thumbs up and some did thumbs down. <laughs> well, at least, yes, exercise good, poor sleep, poor exercise yeah. bad. So it sounds like we've yeah. a handle on that one. Yeah. Um, alcohol. Alcohol. Oh, everybody's love-hate relationship. Let's go laughy face. <laughs> that one's in the negative. Negative right. for your gut. Negative for your gut. Medicines and antibiotics. Also a tricky one. Like good mm. for killing an infection. Mm. not so good for your gut pretty much that's Ba-bow. right okay eating a variety of fruits and veggies didn't we have that one at the start oh. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> fruit and vegetables correct staying hydrated Woo! staying hydrated yep we're getting lots of thumbs up here and then lastly diet high in ultra processed foods Oh, boo. Boo is correct. Boo. Okay. Yep. All right. Moving on. Thank you, everyone. So what can gut issues look like? Oh, 
Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Um, gut issues differ from person to person. Symptoms can look like constipation, diarrhea, nausea, stomach pain, gramp- cramping, gas and, blo- gas and bloating, reflux, indigestion, and more. And we can all experience these from time to time. However, if you feel you experience these often and they can be causing you discomfort often within your lifestyle and causing you grief, it could be helpful to head to your doctor um, as a starting place to be checked out for any kind of gut issues that could be going on and to rule out anything that potentially Anastasia discussed earlier as well. So if there are any gut issues at play, a dietitian can then help identify what kind of factors could be involved with these symptoms identifying foods that could be triggering and also help with managing symptoms. So tune into your gut. When or if you experience these symptoms, it could be really helpful to write these symptoms down. What you ate prior to the symptoms, how you were feeling, were you stressed, were you calm, if you're taking any new medications, if you eat a bunch of takeaway food prior, um, did you add artificial sweetener to your coffee, all of these sorts of things are helpful to note down. And then by writing these down, you may start to see a pattern with your symptoms and any triggers and then a professional can help work with you on those. I think that's where the origin of like gut instinct or a gut feel comes from. Like people always knew that their gut had the answers. So true. So true. (laughs) Okay. So to summarize, our guts can be very complex, but by eating a healthy variety diet full of those foods that are high in fiber, like our fruits and veggies, high in our pre and probiotics, keeping our bodies hydrated and keeping them moving with exercise, reducing our stress and intake and decreasing our intake of those ultra processed foods, alcohol and artificial sweeteners can really help the microbiome in our guts be healthy. Even if you start slow by changing just one thing within your life, seeing how you feel, slowly increasing um, this over time. So maybe you decide to increase your fiber by keeping the fruit, uh, the skins on fruit and veggies, like we all discussed earlier. And then maybe we, we focus on our water intake. Um, starting slow can really make all of this less overwhelming, more achievable, and you can slowly work towards making positive changes to your life. Yay. Positive Yay. life. Woo. <laughs> Okay, so if you are interested in seeing a dietitian, the UC Nutrition and Dietetics Clinic um, offer a great service at affordable rates. So it's basically a student-led clinic that offer individualized dietary advice, comprehensive nutrition assessments, um, body composition analysis. Um, We can help you, basically, if you would like to. I want to come to the student clinic. (laughs) I'm going to book myself in. Oh, no. Feel free to note down these notes above. The contact. I'll people. send. Um, I'll send all this information out in a follow up email as well. If people can't scramble for a pen. Um, oh. And do the clinics run in just in semester in, or is it's not all year round? Is it? We're pretty much all year round. Oh, pretty much. Sure. Um, okay. Placements are all across the year, so. Okay. Yeah. Just good to ring up or email and find out. Absolutely. So please feel free to um, book an appointment if you are interested. Now we've got some time Ooh. for questions and answers. So please hit us with your questions. I will stop sharing as well so that we, I can have a look at the chat as well. One of the things that was just mentioned earlier that I thought I might touch on was um, there was just a comment about two and a half litres for men is quite a lot. Um, yeah, and yeah, too. it does, does sound, it is quite a lot um I guess too it's good to remember that fluid um needs can vary depending on how hot it is how much exercise you're doing so it is a more general sort of recommendation um can anyone think of another way you could you could perhaps monitor if you're drinking enough fluid what might be a sign of dehydration any thoughts the color of your pee that, yeah, good one. I went there. I went there, yeah, everybody. <laughs> good one. Good one. And of course, probably also your stool as well. Yeah, headaches. Yep. Yeah. Someone's commented on that. Yeah. So I mean it is a general recommendation. Um but uh but yeah, they're all good ways to to keep an eye on it. Um I've often had, certainly if I've turned up to emergency for something else, but they always check how dry my tongue is. 
mm. immediately is a quick check that seems to be uh, white. what do they look at what are they looking for in your tongue if it's gone just, white or dry just to see if it, if it's dry um because it might okay. not feel that way but evidently it looks that way that's at least what i've been told mm-hmm. i have little markers I've, i found a drink bottle that's like on the sides of it it tells me like nine o'clock eleven o'clock da, 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 and you're supposed to like get to the bottom and then refill it for your like afternoon ones. Like I'm not great at following it, but it is on there as a guide and it does prompt me. Um, Some people one. find as well that if they're drinking out of a straw, it can help them. Like if I have my drink bottle, I can press my head while I'm doing work or something and just. And if you've got water. sensitive teeth and the tap water temperature in Canberra is not the friendliest on sensitive teeth, you can get a real shock. Um, so drinking out of a straw bypasses the freezing cold teeth water phenomenon, which is another <laughs> another one of my least favourite things. Um, eating, I guess, yeah, I was going to say eating watermelon, but that wasn't the question. It was like how to measure water. But like also lots of fruits and vegetables can be quite high in water too, which helps. Um, there are a few little questions in there. Do you recommend taking a daily probiotic? Now we all see the marketing around those little – inner health pluses and all of the stuff. So is there an advantage to taking a daily probiotic? Do any of the students want to, oh, Anastasia's nodding. Go for it, Anastasia. Yeah, unless someone else wants to take it. No, you've got it. I found you. You're there. I think where we can, it's really important to try and get as much in through our diet as a first approach. And then it's also cheaper. It is a lot cheaper as well. (laughs) And if you're not able to and you feel like you do need to take a probiotic, um, it might be best to go talk to a GP or a dietitian about a really good high quality one. Um, mm. But we want to focus on a food first approach if that is possible, I think is the best way to go. Yeah. It's not like a just blanket, take them and it will solve problems situation, is it? Amelia's okay. nodding. Did you want to? No, nope, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks to all of you people for your practical advice. Do you have advice for people with inflammatory conditions. And this is one that came up a bit. There seems to be a lot of inflammation in the body systems and food, as we just learned, can be quite related to that with your gut microbiome. Um, So what should people with inflammatory conditions look out for or potentially alter in their diet? Do, 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 do. Anastasia took the first one. Anyone else? Students aren't looking keen. Um, oh. Yeah, I think I think I mentioned it in my speech as well, but it's it depends on what condition you have as well. I think mm-hmm. following what Alethea and Samantha talked on is a really great start and then going to go see someone um, who can give you really personalised advice it obviously depends on what condition because each condition has different treatments and management um, for them. So I think a really good start is what Alethea and Samantha said, and then going to see someone for personalised. Like mapping mapping the foods that are potentially setting off that inflammatory kind of response is a good sort of diarising and journaling food is a general good starting point, isn't it? I'm like just <laughs> answering questions like I'm a nutrition student yeah, as well, which I'm not. <laughs> it definitely helps. If you've got something already to come in and say, this is I've eaten this, these are my symptoms, see if we can find any patterns that absolutely does help. Yeah, because there's not going to be like a one like, oh, it's grapes and then that's going to work for everything. So, it yeah, must really depend on what's triggering. Yeah, Yeah. Um, I'd probably just maybe add to that, like probably depends also if we're just more generally talking about inflammatory conditions or if we're talking about inflammation in the bowel um, Mm. conditions. So inflammatory bowel conditions, um have some really specific medical management that needs to happen as well. So um, whereas there are some, you know, foods that are really good in general for inflammation, but it wouldn't be the sole treatment for a lot of those conditions. So some of those um, 
we probably don't have a, it could be a whole nother session, but um, if Give anyone has heard of the Mediterranean diet, yep. Um, yep. that is quite good for inflammation as a more general approach. Like are you talking so, like inflammation in joints and inflammation in your body yeah. in general? What is it yeah. about the Mediterranean diet that helps uh, with that? Does it, do any of the students want to pop quiz putting students. you on the spot? <laughs> I think just the fact that it's um, well balanced and it's containing our fresh food and veggies, um, our plant-based foods, they're really great at reducing inflammation. Yeah. Is seafood, is seafood also helpful? I'm not a student. Shush, Michelle. Okay, go see us uh, And also some good um, fats like olive oil, nuts and seeds. Um, so what did you just mention? Sorry? Seafood as well? Seafood? Yeah. Seafood, yeah, it's low in uh, low in saturated fat. It's pretty good source of protein, and mm-hmm. some seafood like oyster, um, uh, this kind of shellfish, also high in iron, the zinc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty pretty good. Yeah, did they yeah, nail it? The omega threes and omega sixes as well yeah. um, <laughs> are a part of the Mediterranean diet through, and fish is a good one for that, um, as well as some nuts and seeds. Mm. Okay, that's a good one to look into for general overall inflammatory conditions, but for specific inflammatory bowel conditions, it's going to be very varied depending on your experience. Are there any probiotics that don't contain tyramine tyramine what is a tyramine when it's at home in a probiotic <laughs> we're all like Ew. no i have no idea so is anyone amelia amelia's saving us here so um i guess probably the main context in which people might the avoiding tyramine um, is that um, it's advised not to be consumed with certain um, medications. Um, so that is quite a specific scenario. So I'm not sure if we're talking yeah, about, right. I guess, probiotics that are, um, I'm guessing, in sort of capsule form um, or in, yeah, getting it from the pharmacy, I, um, I think. is What, what is, is, what is tyramine? tyramine? What is that? It's a type um, of- so it is found in, it's generally found actually in aged products. So like aged cheeses and those oh, sorts of things. Okay. Yeah. Like a, like a um, vintage cheddar. Yeah. Oh. So it, yeah, it causes issues um, when someone's taking certain medications. Um, okay. So that's a bit of a specific one. Not sure yeah. of exactly which probiotics or foods. So maybe foods low in tyramine would be ones that are not aged. Is that is that a fair assumption? <laughs> is that simplifying it too much? Don't know. Okay, yeah. Michael, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Where is yeah, the question? Right. Oh, okay, um, you wanted to this, say that loud. Right. This, yep. this is something that um, either doesn't come up in discussions about gut health or it's, it's very, very rare. And... Um, I'm particularly interested in this, um, and it's uh, the toilet posture. And just oh. briefly, um, Homo sapiens have been around for 300,000 years, about mm-hmm. 10,000 generations. And for all of that time, with the exception of the last four or five generations, um, humans have been squatting to clear their bowels. So the musculature in the in the whole diaphragm area has evolved to support the squatting posture. Hmm. Um, Populations, we tend to focus on disease in the West and ignore pretty much what happens in developed countries, but I've lived in developing countries. And populations that squat to clear their bowels have virtually zero incidence of um, prostate cancer, appendicitis, colon cancer, and with less impact, hemorrhoids. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is virtually impossible to 100% clear the colon without squatting. The anatomy is fairly straightforward. 
without going in, in into any detail. About... <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's going a bit. Yeah, I'm imagining it, but let's let's not describe it out too fully. Well, it is it is impossible, and it results. There's there's two items for the for the medically informed. There's a puborectal muscle which kinks the rectum, um, which this only so only unkinks when you're squatting. If you're sitting, it remains kinked. When you're standing, it's kinked at uh, ninety degrees. Right. The other thing is there's an ileocecal valve that is at the junction of the colon and the small intestine. It is only fully closed off when you lift your right knee and your thigh compresses against the abdomen. It closes off the ileocecal valve, which stops the back flush from the colon into the um, uh, small intestine. In any right. case... This lack of clearance means that fecal matter accumulates in the um, colon in the exact areas where colon cancer exists, okay? So it accumulates in the um, sigmoid colon and also in the, the cecum. Wow. Is anybody aware of any discussion about this? Because this is about prevention. It's not about intervention it's not about disease management it sounds like a simple thing that you couldn't hurt i mean i mean i know that a lot of yeah um asian countries and developing countries tend to have more of a squat toilet type you know exactly. just, i'm just thinking of my travels through southeast asia there was in, in exactly. china and this is the reason um, why those diseases i mentioned are very low rates very contribute. low for, probably so different... definitely in our practice um, as dietitians, we often talk to people about toilet positioning if they're it's usually more in the case of people I guess are coming to us not for I guess that preventative yeah. they're coming with it with some issues but it's certainly something we we try and look at people uh, or holistically. the situation holistically and mm. certainly um, uh yeah, toilet positioning is part of that. And sometimes it's a bit of a middle ground. Um, many people are not that comfortable with exactly. fully squatting, but um, getting all the way down there, you might never get back up again. Yeah, sometimes the um, approach is more about, um, yeah, finding a middle ground that works. But like still a toilet promoting that you yeah. can lift your feet on is a yeah. suggestion from yeah, the Yeah, so it's something, yeah, that we exactly. do take into consideration and try to encourage for for healthy bowel move, movements as well. Yeah. This this is a difficult issue because from the age of 12 months, infants are potty trained. They're, they're told they should not squat and they'll be chastised if they squat. They have to sit on something. Yeah, this, it's a bit of a cultural is, difference, isn't it? Yeah. I Yes, it is a cultural difference, but I think it's more serious than that. It's, 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 it's a severe health issue that we've been trained by the people who love us you know from an age of 12 months not to do what we evolved to do hmm. and the impact oh. so there's a whole range of diseases that accrue as a result of that all right well that is a very interesting point and i'm glad to hear that that is something mm -hmm. mentioned in um dietitian dietitian and no what am i trying to say nutrition and dietetics as a concept and that's um really interesting but i might just move us on to the next question can taking a probiotic be okay to take with children with reduced appetite from medication oh okay so if the if a child's taking say an adhd medication or something that reduces their appetite would a prebiotic help them it's an interesting question I think Tony very much answered that question and yes, it is okay, but um, definitely go talk to a, a GP or a doctor, or gastroenterologist, whoever's looking after you. Um, oh, it's probiotic it's, too, not prebiotic. Yeah. 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 Just to confirm that that's okay to take. Yeah. Probiotics all, are one of those ones, aren't they? Yep. Go for it. I was going to say, and also there might be a whole, whole lot of other um uh, strategies around appetite that might be more effective potentially. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a parcel of things going on with uh, medication and reduced appetite that might be a whole consultation. Um, 
It gets complex when the conditions are part managed with lots of antibiotics. Was that as was that in response to something else, or is that just a observation? It gets complex when okay. Oh, I see. If you have a condition that is ongoingly part managed by antibiotics, how can you sort of help yourself in that arena? Um, if you have to take antibiotics long term, are there some tips there in terms of nutrition? Amelia's waiting for the students. <laughs> what about Samantha? You can have a go at that one. Do you want to have a go? Put you on the spot. Um, I'm just thinking, I guess, like as Anastasia said, um, it's ideally best to get most of like um most of like the nutrition through the diet um mm -hmm. I guess like if you are taking you know if you are constantly also eating like probiotic like foods like the fermented foods or even um I think uh, I'm not too sure but um I would assume that I guess as long as you're kind of topping up on your probiotics and I guess eating um like you know a wider like a wider uh, range um of foods I don't think it should be um I don't think it would yeah. um, I guess you can manage your gut with that um not too sure um I guess does Amelia have any I ideas as well or anything to add on yeah, so I think medications and antibiotics are still really important. They play a really important role. So certainly, um, yeah, at times we need to take those. And I guess it's just optimising um, what we are eating through our diet as well. Um, because if we do that, then that's better than not doing anything at all. Yeah, I can understand how that would be quite a complex. Up and, and in down. fact, some of our um, some of the gastrointestinal conditions that Anastasia talked about, you know, does sometimes involve antibiotic treatment, and that's really important to get someone in a in a more well um, state, and then um, yeah, go from yeah. there. So they are I mean important. There's sometimes you've got to weigh up the um, benefits and the challenges and come up with a sort of middle ground strategy that helps both sides. Um, that is all the questions we have in the chat. We still have probably two-ish minutes of question time. Does anyone have any final thoughts or have we maxed out our question asking anything specific about what we talked about I thought of something halfway through and I've completely forgotten but um I think we've had a pretty good pretty good spread um right so I will move on to the closing part by thanking our students and Amelia so much for joining us that was really informative and it was a really um great sort of segmented dive to have a little think about each topic. I'm sure each one of those could be a whole presentation on their own, but as overall general advice, I thought it was really clear and really interesting. Um, so thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned, there is the UC student clinics if people are interested um, obviously also see GP. I think we've said that about 40,000 times in this, so that's good. GPs are important and health advice is specific to your own um, bodies and your own environment and your own situation. So definitely do that. I'll give a little plug. Um, we've got a Canberra Health Literacy website. So there's lots of great resources on how to become more health literate and how to get the most out of your doctor's appointments. And if you're need a bit of help and advice on that, go check out the Canberra Health Literacy website. Um, I'm going to compile all these bits of links and information and probably the presentation slide and even a um, edited version of this video and send it out to all the people who registered tonight. So you can look forward to uh, re-watching and re-enjoying and having a look through those slides if you've forgotten anything. Um, we love to collect a little bit of feedback. Everyone loves a survey, don't they? Um, so if you've got, I think it's three minutes to um, fill out our survey and just let us know how we all went as presenters and how the inf you found the information and if it was useful and good for you or if you have any feedback around things we could do better, pop into the very quick survey and let us know. Um, 
Healthcare Consumers Association runs these events. Uh, Managing Your Health is a series we do every year. Um, so keep an eye on our Humanitics website and um, or if you're interested in health advocacy, um, we're the peak body for health advocacy for consumers. So you can have a look on our website and see what we do as well. Um, Just think... to jump in, Michelle, um, because my event's next up on, on the list. Oh, if you jump yeah. on Humanitics, I've just posted an event on advanced care planning for oh, Diet No Day in August. Um, so that's another free one. And I really encourage people to come and check that out. Yep. Go have a look on our Facebook, our Humanities, our website. We've got lots of free things about health um, that you should come and check out. Um, so I thanked everyone. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And I think that is everything tonight. Everybody's nodding. Okay. I will give you nine minutes of your evening back, just like that, to go and have a cup of tea and think about all this wonderful nutrition advice. Um, Okay, I'll let everyone filter out. Thank you and bye.